Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Um, I have a pretty fun topic tonight. It's going to be about the Dubov Tarash, which sounds like a pretty specific opening, but tonight I want to show you how it can help fill some holes that you might have in your repertoire, uh, and how it's an excellent backup option if you're hoping to kind of surprise someone um, it's a great way to sort of take the game into your own hands as uh, the player with the black pieces against 1d4. You have a lot, of, uh, a lot of sway in which direction the game is going to go in if you know the Dubov Tarash. So to start with, I want to look at not the Dubov Tarash and say, you know, what happens against 1d4? So me personally, I play openings like the Nimzo Indian or the Rogozin. Uh, or some of those uh, closed Catalan lines or open Catalan lines where you start with knight f6 against something like c4, you go e6, and you know against knight f3 or g3, you go with d5 against knight c3. I don't personally play the queen's gambit declined, but you could play the queen's gambit declined here, um, or the Nimzo Indian. And this is a really nice way to start the game with black against 1d4 because it keeps your options open, and your openings are going to stay pretty consistent if you have this setup, right? You can do this against uh, many, many things. You can do this against the London, for example. You can do this against uh, two knight f3. You can just go for this knight f6, e6, d5 setup kind of against anything. Uh, now, almost anything is, is what I should say, because I want to introduce you guys to this move order here, starting with the English, OK? So a lot of people are happy to play something like e5 against the English, take the game into sort of different territory, or the, even the symmetrical, for example. Uh, but many players, myself included, uh, are still hopeful that we can get into our setups against d4 that we, we so desire. You know, something like knight f6, our opponent can transpose immediately, or if they want to do something like g3. Again, we're going to have our consistent plan here, playing knight f6, e6, and d5 keeps things a little bit simpler for the player with the black pieces. If you're playing similar setups against d4, against c4, then you're, you're going to be able to understand your positions a lot better. Uh, but it turns out white can make our life a little bit harder here with this move knight to c3. Um, and this move order specifically is why I myself decided to pick up the Dubov Tarash. I was having a lot of trouble figuring out what to do against this. So who has any idea? What happens if we tried to go for our e6, d5 plan that we've seen before? What do you think white can go for after e6 here? E4. Yeah, e4 right away. And you can still go d5, and you should still go d5 probably. But this is going to be a very, very different line to, to ones that we've seen before, where we're going for our plan of knight f6, e6, d5. Uh, after e5, black has to know quite a bit in this opening variation. There's a lot to know. White has a lot of options. And I'm not entirely certain black uh, completely equalizes at the end of it. So pretty scary stuff, uh, this e4 move after two knights c3. Uh, but the good news for us is the Dubov Tarash is here to save the day. We can get into uh, kind of similar positions uh, where we are going for this e6 d5 plan. Uh, and so how are we going to get there? It seems like if we play e6 right away, we're just walking right into pawn to e4. Uh, well, it turns out that the way to do it is to play 2c5. And what is the point of this move? Well, now if white's going to try this move e4, we can very, very easily go knight to c6. And this is going to be a much better setup for us than when we played e6. Uh, first of all, white is not getting this e5 move. Second of all, we have not committed our e pawn to e6. And we can develop uh, very, very comfortably here. Uh, and we can continue, actually, with e6 and d5, uh, just to name one line. We, of course, can also go for these setups as well. And this is just not going to be the, the best setup for white here. You don't really want to com commit this pawn to e4 if you're not getting e5, uh, as we saw in that other line. So 2c5 essentially makes white go back into, a, into normal territory here. So we're going to see knight f3 by white. And now again, we can go e6, because the c5 move has delayed our opponent's plans. Um, now g3. and Again, if e4 here, I'm not sure if people really try this, but we can go knight c6. And again, we're going to go for something similar. e5 would be a mistake, because knight g4 just picks up this pawn. Um, so e6, g3, and now knight c6 is what we can start with. We can also start with d5, totally fine. Uh, we're going to go d5 here. Takes, takes, uh, and d4 
for white is the key idea here. If white uh, tries to waste time by playing something like castles, black is going to be very happy to play d4 himself, grabbing all this space, making this knight look a little bit awkward. So d4 for white is the way to play. Uh, and at the moment, we are in a normal Tarash. So what makes it the Dubov Tarash? Does anybody know Dubov's special idea here that sort of revived the Tarash opening in general? <clears throat> what does Dubov want to play in this position? OK, first of all, what, what moves look normal? What would be a normal idea here? Yeah, you just want to develop, right? So bishop e7 is the move they played in the olden days. And this is sort of the, the mainline Tarash, if I'm remembering correctly. And unfortunately, uh, after let's put castles, castles on the board, um, unfortunately for black, this can be quite uncomfortable. Uh, there are a number of different moves in the database. This bishop can kind of go anywhere. White can immediately take on c5. Or white can try and make your life a little bit harder by going b3 and going for really annoying ideas like knight to a4. Like just for example here, knight e4, bishop b2, and knight a4. And it turns out it can be very, very difficult for black to actually hold on to all the pawns here. The c5 pawn is going to be a pretty big weakness. We're not really thrilled about playing c takes d4 when white's bishop is very, very well placed to already target this pawn on d5. And white's other bishop is well placed to, to support the square in front of the pawn. Just a, a very good IQP setup for white in this instance, compared to the normal IQPs that you, you should be getting. Um, and yeah, like I said, I mean, there, there are a number of ways to go about this here with white. Uh, bishop to g5 sort of forces you to do something with this pawn immediately due to these combined threats. And it's just not so comfortable for black. Uh, and so people didn't play this so often at the top level because white has all these options, you have to know so much, and you might not even be fully equalizing with some serious structural deficits. Uh, but Dubov had a fantastic idea here, not to waste time by developing slowly, but just to force the issue in the center right away. Play c takes d4, knight takes d4, and rather than develop the bishop to the slower square of e7, we're coming out to f6, where is Dubov putting this bishop, do you think? Yeah, bishop c5. And immediately, it turns into a very uh, concrete variation. We are threatening the knight on d4, forcing white's hand to play in the center before he could comfortably finish development, before you know he could get his ideal setup, b3, bishop b2, before he could securely blockade this pawn. Uh, already, we are fighting for the square in front of, of the d-pawn. Now, uh, what? comes to mind here as a potential tactical refutation of this opening. What might, uh, what might white try here to say, you've, you've gone too far. You can't do this just yet. Protect the knight. You can protect the knight. Um, something like bishop e3 is, is playable. But I think even queen to b6 might give you some, some serious problems here. I can renew this threat. And uh, it turns out after something like knight to c6, we can actually delay taking this knight, take here instead. And you've got some very serious, uh, very serious problems to, to think about here. So defending the knight, um, white's not lost, but uh, that's not going to be one of the more testing variations here. So whenever you open up the d file um, early on, it, of course, increases the pressure against this pawn. right? So this would be the first thing that comes to my mind if I had never seen this opening before. I'm like, hey, wait a second. I'm attacking this pawn a lot of times. Maybe I can tactically uh, win it. Yeah. Manny says, queen b6, knight a4. Yeah, That's going to get into some theoretical lines where I'm going to check on this diagonal. Um, yeah. Queen b4 is, is the move. And then this is actually still a playable line, though, Manny, for, for white. It's a peace sacrifice temporarily, but uh, white might get it back. At the end of the day, though, black is doing well in that variation. Mm. So this is a, a, just a two-move tactic here. White can make a threat and also attack the d-pawn, and then white's going to be able to capture the d-pawn on the next turn. There's not really a way for, for black to stop it.
Very, very concrete. We just make two threats at the same time. Yeah, Manny has the right idea in the chat. We just go knight to b3, and look at that. We've made two threats at the same time. Bishop's attacked, so is the pawn. You cannot defend both. And this is one of the main variations uh, in the opening. Um, knight b3 is one of the two main, main moves here. The other one being knight takes c6. We're going to take a look at both. Um, so to start with, uh, black has to save the bishop. And it does turn out that uh, the reason why maybe they didn't play this bishop c5 move uh, in the olden days is this is just, just a pawn sacrifice. You have to be ready to give up this pawn, uh, amongst other things. So to start with, before we get into uh, the mainline theory and what people tend to do at the top level, I thought it was worth spending a little bit of time up at the front about what happens if white actually takes this pawn. Because if you're not comfortable uh, when white takes the pawn, I think especially at you know slightly lower levels, maybe like 1,000 to 2,000, People are going to see this two-move tactic if you play this in a serious game against them, and you have to be ready to respond against it. I find players um, at all levels are very materialistic, and so if they haven't seen it before, they might be very, very tempted to snatch this pawn. They might think you've messed up early. Uh, so let's take a look. What are we going to do after knight takes d5? How is black doing OK here? Well, it turns out there's not an immediate you know, tactical refutation or anything. White is allowed to capture this pawn. Uh, and we're just going to play the simple move bishop to e6. Um, we're just going to develop our pieces, keep the pressure up against white, and, uh, and try and uh, get active play for, for the pawn. So once again, I think a few moves should immediately spring to mind here for white. Right? White has just spent some time capturing the pawn. We've attacked the knight. So uh, I think in general, a very human thing to do is to try and play as quickly as possible here with white. You know, you snatched your pawn. Now you want to get out of dodge, uh, solve your problems, get castled, and then claim that you're, you're up a pawn in the long run. So with those ideas in mind, what, what do you think about with the white pieces here? Taking either piece. Yeah, taking either piece, right? You know, why waste time moving the knight again when you can just trade the pieces? So again, I think these are the most human moves, but it turns out they are definitely not the best in this position. Black is going to have a very easy game if white takes either of these pieces. So we're going to look at those two lines first. But then I also want to mention, uh, while we're just in this position, the move e4 is a very serious try. Uh, and I think the move knight c3 is the move, uh, at least that er Erwin Lamy uh, recommends as the best try for white in this line in his chessable course, which, by the way, if you are interested in picking up this opening, it's a great chessable course. It's not too long, and it's very informative on, on the different lines. So g give that a look. I definitely use that as a good reference when, uh, when prepping for this lecture. Uh, so let's start with taking the bishop, because I think this is the most natural. You, know, you see this bishop here targeting this f2 pawn. You start to think, maybe this guy is, uh, is the problem piece for me. So knight takes b6. Uh, you might think that our idea is to keep the queens on, take back with queen b6. It turns out we're actually quite happy to take here on d1 and go in for this kind of end game. Uh, I say end game, more of a queenless middle game. Now, why are we so happy about this? Looks like our pawns are absolutely awful. Horrible, horrible pawns. Well, it turns out, as always, uh, this pressure down the A file is going to be very, very important in this position. Uh, on top of that, we immediately just have a very concrete threat, right? Like, this is uh, a threat, and white is going to have to do something about it. Otherwise, he's in, in big, big trouble. Uh, so it turns out there's a, a couple main moves here. Knight to d2 is very, very sensible. And I think that is, uh, you know, I keep saying the more human idea. When I say human idea, you know, players at a certain level are going to know this position. But uh, I'm talking to you guys, sub-2,000 players. I think your opponent's probably going to try knight to d2. Uh, I think that at some point, white is obliged to give up this bishop for this knight and actually fix black structure. And we'll talk about why here. So let's say knight to d2. Let's see if we can come up with some good ideas for black here. How are we going to continue uh, to press? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily you know, the move you're playing right away, but in general, what ideas are we keeping in mind? King e7 and rook hd8. So, uh, if we do move the king, I am going to disagree with you. I think we should castle here. 
Um, not necessarily because we're afraid for a king's safety, although maybe that will be relevant, but we actually do want to have this open E file to our advantage. It's going to be very useful for us to plant a rook here and target this weakness in white structure, which is harder to do with, with the king on E7. Um, so castle short is actually the main move, but the chat recommended the, the move I hoped they would, which is blundering away the game by taking the pawn. So the, the Dubov Tarash, not known for, for being the most materialistic opening. Black is very, very often happy to play these positions down a pawn, which is very, very uh, solid long-term compensation, uh, making white's life very, very tricky. So what happens here? Well, of course, white's going to trade. And then just like Bobby Fischer, your bishop has, has no way home. And white will take his time, king c2, king b2, and this bishop will, will not survive long. In fact, probably white should include this, so there's no knight before stuff. And then this, this idea is just very, very concrete. Very concrete, and black is busted. So don't take that guy. That won't turn out well for you. Um, but OK, let's put castles on the board. And let's say white captures, because if white does not capture, say something like a3, trying to defend the pawn, uh, it's actually black to move and, and pretty much win here. There's, like, there's not much that can be done. Uh, all ready for white. Oh, and then there was a question about bishop takes a2. I'll take a look at that as well in just a moment. Uh, I mean, rook a to d8 is a very thematic move. Oftentimes, the rook will move here in this opening. But we actually just we have a tactical knockout here that's, I think, even, even stronger than rook a to d8. We just have a knockout punch right away. Yeah, this is a, a very common theme that you, you may have seen before when white or, or black uh, loses castling rights early with both knights on the board. You'll find that attacking both of these two squares at the same time gets pretty awkward for, for white to deal with. So I do think knight to d4 is just winning. I think knight to g4 is also winning. Um, let me just blunder check myself. So okay, no, knight to f, knight to g4 is not good enough. Knight to d4 uh, is the idea. So let's, let's try and understand why. Of, of course, it's because white now has time to take, take the knight. Um, and these lines don't quite work because the bishop comes back. Um, so knight to d4 first, but you are correct in thinking that this is the idea. So you try something like e3. We can check. And you are actually quite close to getting just uh, checkmated down these two files. right? Let's say you go here. I just check and check. And take it, take it slow, take it easy. You know, let's say you save the bishop, knight d3, and your, your bishop is not going to survive for, for much longer. All these ideas, checkmate, bishop's hanging, it's just over. Um, OK, so just a word of warning there, how easily things can go wrong for white. Let's say you know, they, they start to like their bishop on the long open diagonal, knight d4, already just strictly winning in, in this position. So with that word of warning aside, of course, white should capture this knight, which does fix your structure. And then I just want to take a quick look at what happens if white plays a3, just holding on to everything. Uh, like I said, the open e file is actually going to be very, very relevant for us. Uh, and so just a move like rook ft8. And like I said, we're not getting the pawn back uh, super immediately, but we're just happy to, to play chess here. So I did put in just some, uh, some moves as an example here. It's actually very difficult for white to reorganize the pieces. Uh, for example, a move like knight to f3 I think is already quite close to, to just being lost. I think we can just go like knight to d5 and you know, br bring, in our, bring in our knight once again. And again, it's, it's going to be tough for white. Yeah, black is already significantly better here. Like bishop g3, for example, knight g4. If you take rook b8, rook takes, and all the rooks start to swarm. The bishop also coming in. And again, very, very easy for white to make a simple mistake, develop in the wrong way, and just be dead lost. Um, but it turns out knight to f1, I think, is the best reorganization for white here. And then we're happy just to make some threats. I just 
He gave bishop c4 as an example. There are numerous moves here. You really are just playing chess down a pawn with a lot of active play. Knight e3, for example, king e1, knight d5, something like d3, c5. And already very active play. Uh, sacrifices are in the air. Um, and black is, is definitely in, enjoying the better side of things here. White may have this extra pawn, but there's just so many traps, so many tricks for, for white to look out for that I, I do think it's very, very difficult to play practically, which is probably why we don't see this line so often. Um, just to continue the example line a little bit, something like this is how you would reach uh, a more or less equal end game where, yes, uh, white is up a pawn in the long run, but it's very clear to me that white is not going to be able to make use of this extra e pawn anytime soon. And I would much rather be black with my rooks connected, pressure on the files, and uh, just enjoying a, a pleasant game. Um, OK, so what was all that about? That was about what happens when uh, black or white plays knight takes b6 here. Remember, we were saying we take on d1, take away white's castling rights, take on b6, and then the mixture of these kinds of threats with threats of knight g4, knight d4, threats down the e file, give, white, or give black a very, very comfortable game and give white a lot of problems. Very easy to just be strictly lost here. And in my opinion, I think that uh, if I were a player with the white pieces who had never seen the Dubov Tarash, I honestly think that this is going to be the most common line that you run into, right? Somebody attacks your bishop, takes a pawn, gets scared about the dark squared bishop, and next thing you know, you're in this position where there are a thousand ways white can go wrong, and only one or two that where he can uh, survive the opening. Uh, okay, so let's continue on then. Remember, I said there were a few other moves to look at here. What happens if knight takes f6? This one is also going to be very simple. We take, we take back with the queen in this case. Castles, castles, something like bishop to d2. Uh, trying to develop here, we are going to immediately get our pawn back. And this is why uh, black is doing fine in this position. Again, we're very active. And again, white has problems developing because you have to stay tethered to this, to this pawn. Um, the only game in the database here, white went queen d2 to try and develop out with queen c3. And black simply allows it. It's totally fine. We go bishop c4. And again, all, this kind, all, these, uh, all these bishops in the position are, are going to give black a, a very comfortable game. You just immediately get your pawn back, and there is no reason at all why black should be worse. So moral of the story, the most uh, natural lines, in my opinion, knight takes d5 and knight f6 and knight b6, no problem at all for black. Very, very easy to get an active game. Uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at e4 here. Uh, e4, black does have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, it's very strong to immediately challenge this queen um, on d1, make it pick a square. And there is some stuff to know here, but I just wanted to show an example line, something like queen to c2, stepping out of the way. We're going to go rook to c8, introduce threats on the c file, something like castles, and immediately knight b4, we are able to capture on d5, castle ourselves. We've dealt with the annoying knight uh, sitting there on the d5 square. And once again, white has serious problems getting developed. We have a lot of active play. Uh, this bishop on b6 especially going to be a very active piece. And this pawn on d5 doesn't really concern us that much. It's, it's not exactly mobile. And once again, black is going to be doing fine. Expect to see black try and come in, come in on the e file as normal. Stuff like queen d7 and bishop h3, also very, very reasonable. Uh, very common attacking themes here that you, you've all probably seen before. Um, just to give an example line, this is all I put in before the lecture, but let's say uh, something like rook to e1, queen to d7 again is a very normal idea. White needs to activate this dark squared bishop, so let's say uh, queen f4, and again, bishop h3, super common attacking ideas that, uh, like I said, you've probably seen before. We can take, and something like rook c6, and we have no problem at all uh, kind of picking this pawn back up, playing a slightly better position. OK, so that's just one example after e4. Again, if you want all the details, um, I can't provide them to you in an hour. Uh, but one resource, like I mentioned, is uh, Chessable. Chessable is a great course by Erwin Lumi that uh, I highly recommend. Uh, OK, last thing to check is knight c3, which again is potentially the most testing. Uh, the thing to know here is we are no longer happy taking on d1, of course, because white is now taking back with the knight. We don't get all this counterplay because of white's king in the center. So we should keep our queen on the board, something like castles, castles, bishop g5. And again, we're going to play very simply. We bring our rooks to the open files, 
We force the issue with this bishop. And before too long, stuff like knight b4 happens, rook uh, f to e8. And uh, I, I ended the line here. But just for example, knight e4, not going to give you problems. So you just go queen e5. And again, look at how awkward it is for, for white to try to develop. Queen in the way of the rooks. The rooks can't come to the files. Pressure on this b2 pawn is going to be relevant. Pressure on the e3 pawn also going to be very relevant. This knight threatening to jump into d3. And sacrificial ideas, once again, are, are in the air. Um, and with that, I don't want to spend any more time on knight takes d5, because at least at the top levels, people don't really play this move. And the reason they don't play this move is the reasons I just showed. Black has a lot of fun. White does not have a lot of fun. But I wanted to spend a lot of time at the front here, because I really do think in a practical game uh, below you know, a certain level, below 2,000, I don't think many people are, are going to be able to resist the urge to, to capture this pawn for free. Um, so any questions on knight takes d5 before we move on to a couple model games in, in the more normal lines? That was a lot to cover, but hopefully the ideas are, are sort of sticking with you. You know, you play actively with the pieces, pressure against the king in the center, pressure against white's queen side, pressure against uh, the e pawn coming down the e file. If you keep those ideas in mind, you're going to be doing fine. All right, any questions? All right, we'll, we'll move along then. So uh, let's take a look at what happens if white captures on c6 in this position. This, I believe, is one of the main lines. And it's also uh, one where white is going to be in some trouble if he doesn't know quite a bit. So for this game, we're going to turn to our hero, uh, Daniil Dubov, against uh, Maxim Rodstein uh, in one of our model games in this variation. So. Uh, Dubov, of course, the namesake of the opening, uh, is the guy who's been playing it the most. Actually, I don't know if we can show the database, Ben, uh, but if you look here in this position, the top game, Carlson Dubov, second game, Mabadyarov Dubov, Nakamura Dubov, Nakamura Dubov, Duda Dubov, Zhang Dubov, Rajstein Dubov. This Dubov guy, he plays this opening. <laughs> There's a reason it's named after him. Um, but OK, d4 in this position. Knight c6, bishop g2, uh, c takes d4, knight takes d4. We've reached the starting uh, tabia for our opening here. It's again, bishop c5 is Dubov's idea. And today, we are now looking at this move, knight takes c6. So at first glance, this might not make as much sense to you, right? Uh, why take on c6? Why allow black to support his central pawn that was once weak and isolated uh, when we could just play a move like knight b3? And as we saw, maybe not even take right away, but at least leave this pawn isolated and a little bit weaker. So what's the logic here? Why take on c6 and allow b take c6? Does anybody have an idea? Hanging pawns. The hanging pawns. OK, so what do we know about the hanging pawns structure? Because it's not necessarily a bad thing by itself. So they are a little bit weak because they're on these half open files. They can be targeted. Um, but of course, the upside is that they can give you extra space. right? I, I control all these squares on white's half of the board. And white doesn't control those squares on black's half of the board. Uh, but there is a very particular instance where the hanging pawns are very, very bad. And that is if you do not get them to be uh, sort of level with each other. So let me just throw some moves on the board. Let's say. Um, okay, let's say white passes, for example. We get here, and white continues passing, and we get c5, for example. So with this, we have our pawns together in the, in the center. They control all these nice squares. They're also very, very fluid. Like if we get rook c8, for example, um, you can imagine black at any moment can push d4 if he wants and continue expanding this way. Also, at any moment, c4 could be played by black. The pawns are fluid. They uh, don't defend each other yet, but if they need to, we can step forward, take even more space, and continue rolling with the pawns. So when black is able to do this with the hanging pawns, they aren't necessarily a weakness. However, if we look at the total other side of things, let's say, for example, um, something like knight a4 happens. We come back with the bishop this way. Something like a3, b4. Um, let's say I develop, you develop, I develop you develop. This is the absolute nightmare scenario for black. Now, it seems like we played pretty normal moves, whereas in the other line, I had to pass with white for a while. 
Um, but black is, I think, just positionally lost in, in this position. It's, it's that bad. And the reason is white was able to get control over the backward pawn in black's camp. So this is the risk you're running when you have these pawns on c6 and d5. If white is able to achieve a setup like this, it's, it's big trouble for black. You're, you're not going to survive this game. Like just to show an example line, say I put this knight on c5, something like takes takes. Like already this bishop is a demon and white has the easiest play in the world. We put the rooks on the files, we control all the squares, and black has none of that active counterplay. There's no way these pawns are going anywhere. And black, I, again, I think it's just positionally very, very uh, you know, busted here. It's, it's just too tough. Um, so our task when white takes on c6 is to make sure that happens under no circumstances whatsoever. Uh, so to start with, uh, let's look at this move queen to c2. There are a variety of moves here, including castles first is, is an option, uh, knight a4 first also an option, but our response is going to be pretty uh, consistent against all these moves. So uh, just to throw castles, castles on the board, here basically in some order, white is going for this idea. So we're going to look at queen c2 first. Um, now in the game, Dubov simply castles, which is fine, um, castles, and then we get bishop to b6. And this is basically our response against white's entire, entire setup. Even if he starts with knight a4, we just go bishop b6, and then you, know, you can get to the exact same position um, here, for example. Uh, but we're looking at this move order. Queen c2, castles, castles, bishop b6. We put the bishop on a square where it's defended. We keep it on this nice open diagonal, pressuring the white king side. And after knight to a4, of course, we're not going to back down and give white full control over the c5 square, but we're going to leave this bishop here, fighting for that square. Now, in the game, Dubov chooses bishop to d7, and I actually like this move quite a bit. Now, if you follow my recommendations and go to this chessable course I've been telling you about, you're going to learn about this bishop a6 move, um, but I think bishop d7 is actually uh, quite scary for, for white to handle. So we're going to stick with this move here today. Uh, now. If black were to try to do, or sorry, if white were to try to do something like b4 right away, we're not going to be really as concerned. This bishop here is going to help us uh, fight for the c5 square a lot more, and white is not going to have any kind of easy way to just take advantage of it. In fact, I'm thinking of some tactics here, but maybe we should just keep it simple. Queen e7, again fighting for this square. Uh, and if white wants to make any progress, eventually knight takes b6 is, is going to have to happen. There's just no way that you can get away with knight to c5 here. For example, I think a5 right away is just concretely regaining control over this square. You cannot play a3, as I can take, and there's no way for white to, to keep this, this c5 square under control. Um, so uh, b3 was played in the game first, and now, uh, once again, our counterplay is going to come on this open file. But we'll see here after bishop to b2 uh, that black is going to have some very active ideas. And once again, before we, we show those, I just want to say knight takes b6. We're, we are always, of course, responding with a takes b6. We love the open a file, and we need to control the c5 square. Uh, and white can kind of throw this in at any moment. It's just an idea sort of inherent in the position. Um, or white can delay it for as long as he likes here, for example. In this case, he hasn't yet taken. Um, and this line is very testing for a reason, because it looks like white is sort of finishing development. We've got a bishop on a nice diagonal. This knight looks a little bit silly, but it's going to trade itself off here for this bishop on b6. And it looks like uh, black's counterplay might be starting to slow down a little bit. Like maybe, maybe we are going to pressure down the e-file, and that's going to give us some play. Uh, but it doesn't look like a lot for black. Uh, so black has to get a little bit creative here and come up with some fun ideas. So I'm curious if anybody can come up with the move played in the game. If you're a fan of Alpha Zero and this new age of chess that it has brought upon, then, uh, then you might find this idea a little bit faster. Yeah, OK, so knight g4 is pretty concretely uh, trying to use this bishop on b6 to target f2. Uh, but remember, white is not, or 
White is not really unhappy about making this trade. This is probably going to happen eventually, so it doesn't necessarily make sense to force White's hand into taking on b6 here. And once this bishop disappears, I start to think that this knight doesn't make as much sense uh, on the g4 square, just yet, at least. Just yet. So not knight g4 in the game, but uh, the chat room has it. Uh, we are, in fact, launching our h-pawn down the board here, somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, but yeah, h5 is, is simply the idea. And the reason why we need to turn to ideas like h5 is because in the long run, white is still going to be well set up against the c6d5 structure. You know, these open files are right here, ready for the rooks to jump to. And much like in the classical tarash that, that I briefly showed at the start, white is going to be able to play against this structure really, really well, really easily. You know, um, we saw all the problems black had uh, in the main line of the tarash. And those problems exist here for black as well. Just because we played bishop c5 didn't mean that the structural deficits went away. Uh, but because we played bishop c5, because we're so active, we can launch a kingside initiative at the same time. Uh, now, if you do want to try the move h4 to just slow us down, there are a number, th number of things that uh, black can go for here. But the main issue is that uh, something like, actually, I think knight e4 would be a better move here. And the main issue is that this is a little bit weakening of these, this kingside structure. You know, once we go uh, with knight e4, even after this trade sort of happens, and uh, okay, let's say something like b4, we have to be very, very cautious about leaving this f2 pawn uh, undefended. For example, let's say something like queen to e7, hitting this guy, a3. Um, and, and okay, I'm, I'm not even... Uh, playing very very challenging moves, and black is able to get c5 with all this play. So let's say something like rook to d1 instead, now something like queen to e7, and it's not hard to imagine that something like knight f2, queen e3 is going to be uh, very upsetting for, for white to have to deal with. Maybe not immediately, but these long-term weaknesses are always going to be there. Um, also worth mentioning, we are never unhappy about this trade with our light squared bishop on the board. This is sort of uh, suicidal for, for white. So that's why h4, not such a good move. Knight e4 going to very concretely target the weak spots in, in white's camp then. So in the game, uh, white tries this move e3, sort of challenging the dark squares a little bit more, really kind of ignoring us on the king's side, going for that classical plan of controlling the square in front of the c pawn. Uh, now, of course, if you say a, you have to say b, we're going to go with h4. Um, and now white decides it's time to snap off this bishop, mainly because we were threatening some nasty things like sacrifices on e3, especially in conjunction with knight g4 or knight e4. So we get take take, and now queen to c3 on the board. Um, and thus far, Duboff has played the opening essentially perfectly, uh, but here he does uh, start to go a little bit astray. So in the game, uh, he kind of lost his nerve, I think, and played something, uh, or he played rook c8, which is a, a totally fine move, but it's not really in line with our previous play. Uh, it turns out that uh, black can and, and should believe in the king's side initiative here even further. Uh, and so moves like h3, moves like queen c8, preparing bishop h3, both give black a nice little edge. So just to show an example, say h3, bishop h1, queen to c8, so you play a natural move like rook f to d1. We're already going to come with bishop g4. We're going queen f5 next, bishop f3, knight g4. And uh, white is sort of all but, but checkmated here, just as long as we don't hang g7 ourselves. But I think we can, we can handle that. Um, very good position for black, which I, if I flip on the engine, I think we're close to minus 1 here. Yeah, mi minus 0.7 already, and it's just it's a sad, sad story. White already has to go f3 relying on some tactics, but uh, we don't have to fall for those. And we're just going to bring in the rooks, target these weaknesses, and, and black is doing very, very well in this position. Um, OK, so h3 not found in the game. Instead, we got rook to c8, and then the game sort of took a, a wild turn. We got rook to d1, takes, takes. I have no earthly clue why white thought f takes g was a good idea. I assume he was relying on some sacrifices down the f file. But of course, you should keep the structure a little bit more compact with h takes g. And then Dubov does slowly but surely take control over this game. Again, pressure down the e file is a main idea of ours. We see takes, 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 takes. 
And here, f6 stunts the attack. And now Dubov takes over by invading down the e file. b4, the queen comes in. White's king is going to be weaker than black's here. And at the end of the day, Dubov organizes the pieces, pins this bishop on f2. And after king h7, uh, Rajstein actually goes ahead and resigns here. Difficult to stop bishop d5 and queen g2. Also difficult to defend your bishop. Uh, and together, these things mean white is just dead lost here. So what should white have done? Well, instead of uh, stuff like e takes d5, turns out white is doing OK if we start initiating some uh, sacrifices here. Rook d to f1 first. Something like takes, 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 and uh, white is going to get a lot of counterplay here uh, with sort of the weirdest structure I've ever seen uh, for black. And the, the exchange sort of means nothing here. Um, white is going to be able to take it back at any moment. And we're going to get some sort of drawn end game uh, looking like this. So uh, great game by Dubov. Um, again, all that, it, all that was missing is the, the conclusion, something like h3. And then invading on these light squares would have been deadly for, for Rajstein to deal with. Uh, so let's do a quick recap of how we got here. Uh, once again, we're looking at this line, knight takes c6, b takes c6. Now again, the danger for black is if white is able to get this bind on the queen's side, then black is going to be positionally lost. So that's why moves like queen c2, knight a4 are white's main idea. We see bishop b6 is our response to any of these ideas, bishop b6 and castles. And then uh, defending our pawn on c6 is important. Something like b3. And now we get on, get on the e-file. And once again, h5, h4 is our main source of counterplay. Now we're looking at the weak light squares in the white camp. We're looking at potentially taking on g3, loosening up the dark squares. We're looking at invasions with queen c8, bishop h3 and very classical attacking ideas that are all going to be working out for black in this case. So one more time. This was knight takes c6. And then once again, white is doing this. We're doing castles bishop b6, rook e8. And then we are launching our attack on the king's side with h5. And these ideas do remain pretty consistent. Of course, there's always theory to know, but these ideas do hold true. So questions on the knight takes c6 line? Questions here. OK. Well, in that case, let's move on to the main main line of the opening, which is going to involve knight to b3. And so for that, once again, we are turning to our hero, Daniil Dubov, uh, against Hikaru Nakamura this time. I believe this is the 2019 Grand Prix. Uh, so pretty serious event, uh, one of the candidates qualifier events. And how did we get here? Well, it turns out Nakamura does this exact annoying move order that uh, I was talking about. And Dubov, of course, responds with c5. We get, uh, uh, I think, exactly the same move order as last time. d4, knight c6, challenging the, the d-pawn, bishop g2, c takes d, knight takes d, bishop c5. And now, once again, this knight b3 move. We go bishop back to b6. And now, rather than knight takes d5, which we started the lecture with, of course, Sakaru plays the much better move, king's side castles. Uh, so why is castles so good? Well, remember all those lines where we were relying on things like queen takes d1, relying on pressure against the queen with the white king in the center? Well, after castles, those, of course, sort of evaporate. Now, white is always ready to recapture on d1 with a rook, and those ideas just sort of don't exist anymore. All it takes is, is castling. So we now have a very serious problem. Our pawn on d5 is attacked three times and defended twice. So what should we do about it? What can we do? So bishop e6 would be uh, a normal way of sort of handling things. But uh, as normal in, in the Dubov Tarash, we want to be a little bit more active. We're not really happy uh, putting our bishop on this square. I couldn't tell you the immediate refutation or anything. Uh, maybe something like e3 is, is going to be an issue for us. Taking, uh, again, taking control of the square in front of the pawn, starting to set up blockades, something like knight b5 as well would make a lot of sense. And if white can sort of simplify the position, get a good blockade. Again, he's just going to be positionally better. So more active than bishop e6. What do we think? Does 
Yes, so d4 is going to be our big idea here. Uh, once again, it's important that we play very, very quickly, very actively, and work to disrupt the, the white pieces. So d4 moves our pawn from a square where it's attacked three times to a square where it's only attacked twice. No big deal. Um, and of course, it is attacking this knight. Uh, there's no immediate tactical uh, way to win the pawn, unlike with the pawn on d5. So white is obliged to respond, in this case, with knight to a4. Once again, white targets this bishop on b6, because this piece really is sort of a monster here, targeting all these dark squares. Uh, now it's time to castle for us. And bishop g5 is going to be the move that, that gives us the most problems here. Um, <clears throat> and I believe this is the way to try and win the pawn as well although we can talk about that variation as well. So let's very, very quickly look at knight takes b6. Maybe this is the most concrete way to just win the pawn now. Knight, or queen takes d4 rather than knight takes d4. Um, and here, white, black again is going to be getting very, very active play just in an end game. Uh, once again, pressure down the a file, pressure down these central files. And it's that type of dynamic equality that we saw in the previous end game lines. Uh, but that isn't really in the spirit of this variation, I feel. I feel like that would be more in the spirit of the knight takes d5 variation. So instead, we're looking at the main move here of bishop g5. This keeps the pressure up, doesn't simplify black's task, keeps all the pieces on the board, and uh, makes black continue to deal with this d4 pawn. Uh, in this case, as normal, we're looking for pressure down the e file. Now white does decide it's time to snap off this bishop. And Hikaru's big idea here is this move e3. So what do you think Hikaru has in mind against d takes e3? Why go for this e3 move? It seems like it's going to allow black uh, to get rid of this d4 pawn, which was potentially the biggest weakness in the position. Okay, so you're saying takes back with the f pawn? Uh, no, I was actually thinking of. Uh, I was thinking of that. Okay. <laughs> so why isn't white unhappy about d takes e3? If you take here, it, yep, you do have that. So queen d8, not so, not the answer. Oh, you can take back with the bishop and then we're back in d6. Yeah, it's, it's just that simple. We're just going to play bishop takes e3. And when white has the bishop pair, he very much prefers the opening of diagonals like, like this one, like um, a7 to, uh, to g1 here, right? In this position, this diagonal very closed, this bishop a little bit short on squares. In this position, very comfortable square for this bishop, already raking down the board. And it's clear that black is going to be at least practically a little bit worse. Maybe objectively, black is still doing OK here, but I wouldn't want to be staring down these bishops uh, uh, over the board, for sure. So that's why d takes e3 doesn't really concern Hikaru. He's got the bishop pair. He wants to open up the diagonals. He doesn't really mind allowing black to get rid of this d4 pawn, which is potentially weak. Uh, Dubov came for a fight, and so he says, that's fine. Just like when my pawn was attacked on d5, I'll push it down the board a little bit more. And so the pawn now lands on d3. And that's what makes this position sort of really, really double-edged. Black is playing this game where the d-pawn continues running up the board. If white is going to be able to corral this pawn, then black, of course, will just be down a pawn, and white will again have the bishop pair. Uh, however, if this pawn is able to live and cause some serious problems for white, then, of course, black is going to be very happy in, in that case. So that's the nature of this sort of variation. You have this d-pawn. It's your, both your biggest weakness and your greatest asset here, uh, harassing the white pieces while also you know, living a little bit on the edge. So black, or white in this case, because we did not open up this diagonal, is going to be happy to give up this bishop. Otherwise, something like h6, for example, and I mean, this bishop might be getting trapped if you don't trade it off. Um, so we see takes, and the very, very surprising move here, g takes f6. Um, 
And once again, it's all about the d pawn. Queen takes, gives up the d pawn. We're not going to do that. We take with the g pawn. Um, and this might literally be the worst pawn structure that people intentionally go for in the game of chess. Like this, this is pretty bad for, for a structure. Uh, but once again, it's not about your structural deficits. The tarash is already sort of structurally bad for black. Um, it's about the act of play that, that black is going to be getting. So we take with the g-pawn, and there's not really a way for white to take advantage of all these weaknesses, at least not yet. Um, so now it's time for a3 once again, preventing stuff like knight b4, also just securing the a-pawn from this pressure. We're going to go bishop e6, just developing the bishop. And by the way, if you're concerned about memorizing opening theory, you can play sort of a, a few different moves here. Bishop e6, bishop f5. There's a lot of ways you can organize the pieces here. Once again, we're just playing for dynamic play, piece play, active ideas. So bishop e6 was Dubov's idea. We get rook to c1, rook to c8, just uh, uh, avoiding the threat. Uh, rook, to, rook to c3. And then the key idea for us here is that we do have access to this nice e5 square for the knight. You know, our pawn structure may look bad, but it does help us control a lot of these central squares. So knight to e5 in the game, knight to d4 is Hikaru Nakamura's choice. And then here, uh, Dubov does do something with, with this bishop, but first captures on c3. So it takes, takes, and now white structure ha uh, has also seen better days. So our pawns may be weak, but so are whites. And because of that, because of our active pieces, black, again, is doing totally fine. Uh, Dubov, in this case, decides it's worth it to uh, keep the bishop. OK, first he attacks c3. We defend c3, and then Dubov retreats with the bishop. We get rook to e1, rook to c8. And it's very clear, you know, Dubov's ideas come very, very naturally. The, the c file is half open. There's a weak c pawn. Dubov attacks the weak c pawn. Uh, now a move that you might have been thinking about does finally come on the board. White needs to get rid of this d3 pawn before something bad happens. Um, OK, first rook to c1, sorry, queen to c5. And now the idea I was trying to talk about uh, f4. The only way to get rid of this guy is to get rid of this knight. Only way to get rid of this knight is to kick it away with f4. Uh, Dubov just jumps into c4, and we're going to get the a3 pawn in return. Takes, takes, rook to b1, knight back to d6, uh, creating some threats here. Uh, knight to e2. And then the game comes to a peaceful end after bishop f5, e4. Uh, Hikaru offers a draw. Dubov accepts. Uh, but just to show you, in the final position, uh, or almost the final position, it is actually black who stands a little bit better, which might be very, very surprising to you looking at the structure. Uh, but it turns out black's king not really going to be that weak here when you compare it to white's king. It turns out you know, moving your f-pawn is really bad. And while having two f-pawns is bad, maybe it's not as bad as moving your own f-pawn because the second rank is going to be weak, this diagonal is going to be weak, and uh, it, it is black who has the more active play here. So Dubov's move bishop f5 does equalize the position, but I do think black is a little bit better after this move bishop g4, just uh, renewing the threats against white's position. So for example, h3, we're going to take, come in with rook takes. And here, for example, uh, just to show, white is doing OK with the move queen to b2 when things are going to simplify a little bit. And we'll get a drawn endgame. I think that's the line at least. Um, but if you get ambitious, try and go after the black king. We simply go king to f8. And again, it's, it's whites who, who is getting checkmated here. Just to show you what the computer thinks, we are minus two in this position. You have to defend your king right away. If you start going after ideas here, king to e7 just defends really everything uh, in the black camp. Just to play a few more moves, we can go queen h7. Queen c5 is apparently strong. Uh, king h1, queen e3. And it's clear now that uh, you know, white is under a lot of pressure. Stockfish says minus 3.5, black is just totally, totally crushing. Um, and with that, I think that's all the time I have to talk about the Dubov Tarash. So there are, of course, a lot more lines that you need to look at. There's a lot more to talk about here. And if you do want to learn a little bit more, so again, I recommend that chessable course. I recommend just playing it in your own games, seeing what happens looking at the database, going through some, some of these games that show up. Uh, but overall, a very, very, very fun opening, a very active opening, and an incredibly, incredibly useful opening. So once again, I started my journey on the Dubov Tarash because of this very annoying line, knight to c3. 
which controls d5 and also threatens e4. And I cannot play my normal setups with e6, because e4 is a very, very strong move here, leads, leading to very difficult lines for black. That's where the Duboff Tarash comes in with this move 2 to c5. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is just how versatile this opening is, because me personally, I find it to be the most useful against this c4 knight c3 setup. But just to show you, if you fall in love with the Duboff Tarash, you can play the Duboff Tarash every game. Um, for example, knight to c3, uh, c5. Like you, you can do this here as well. Um, you do have to know some other lines, but uh, if you do want to play the Duboff Tarash, that is your prerogative. You are going to get this position uh, a lot of the time. Just one other way to get there through the classical Tarash move order. Um, so you can play it against d4, c4. You can play it against c4, knight c3. You can play it against uh, really a, a lot of different things, a lot of different setups for white. One of the most versatile openings and one of the most fun openings that, that I've found. Um, so any final questions for me before we call it quits on the Dubov Tarash for today? And I hand it over to GM Josh Fidel. Any questions on the opening at all? We covered a lot today, but uh, hopefully you feel confident in, in the main ideas. Again, it comes back to active play, active ideas. OK, well, with that, thank you all so much for joining me here tonight. Once again, Josh Friedel will be coming in in just a moment to teach Grandmaster's Choice the topic of his choosing. Um, I had a great time looking at all these lines, prepping this lecture. Hopefully you guys enjoy the Dubov Tarash in your own games. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.